All right, here's about where we are, guys. We got the front drive shaft on, all of the bolts tightened up. We need to order two bolts, two nuts. For that, we got all the bell bolts in. I even got the exhaust hanger that is on, you guys will see, even bolted that up. So, we're just draining fluids now. We're gonna get the rear drive shaft up in a little bit. But, here's where we're at. So figure, going all that. While that's draining, let's go over a couple of things. I got the downpipe reattached because when I was finagling with the engine going back and forth, up and down, trying to get the transmission in, uh, kind of popped the downpipe off. Yeah, you can see down there, even the little hanger is uh, on. So definitely today is officially the day. I know I said that yesterday. I got, I, yesterday kind of turned into a clusterfuck. So figure today is the day that everything's in, the interior's done, and then it's all just engine stuff. Now, what I need to show you guys is I went and ordered a lower rad hose and I'm gonna update the list as soon as I find this out. You guys will see lower rad hose, right? For 2003 Dodge. The only thing that sucks about this is this end does not work in the 12 valve because the 12 valve, the inlet, even though it's in the same spot, is actually bigger. So I think on mine, I ended up using the one for the 96, but I will verify that as soon as I go back to AutoZone to swap that out, and we shall go from there. So it shouldn't, not really a big deal, we'll just go swap it out, it's a $20 part, not a big deal. So fan is on, the fan is reverse thread on this motor, though I haven't gotten the coolant, the oil feed or oil drain yet. We will need to at some point work on the throttle cable, but the main focus of today is to just get everything under the truck like I was gonna do yesterday, done today, that way we can put it down, and then it's all just stuff that is on the top. And that's where we're at. So rear drive shaft, uh, if he wants four wheel drive, we'll have to let him know, order a bushing, and we'll get this guy in here. Now I need to go through and figure out which bolts are for what. I know that bolts like these, these are interior screws, and then there's also a bunch of these. I'm hoping that I was able to find every one of them. Two, three, four. I found four, five, six, seven there's one more should be eight of them eight look at that found all eight so all eight of those those go to this plate right here one two three four five oh there's only six okay cool so that goes to them we need the bolts for that we need the bolts for that which i'm pretty sure are these here three and there should be a fourth one i'm not seeing a fourth oh here it is four cool so we have all the bolts for that. Keep all that together. The gasket underneath. And then we need this guy here. We'll get all of that thrown back on. Um, this did not need to come out of the floor at all. Just like this whole shifter assembly, I'm kind of surprised that like the way that they did this. Like I said, I've never actually seen one like this for an NV5600. All right, Nat, all the stuff's here. We will get the Pass or driver's side. Yeah, we'll get the driver's side intake hose on at some point as well. Just because like this side will be physically done and I need that to be in place. Which actually I might not be able to because the coolant reservoir rests over here somewhere too. So I gotta figure all that out. Uh, the coolant reservoir is on order because I have one that goes back there but this specific truck, it sits on this side which i'll show you guys you guys can see here here's the old coolant reservoir no idea how this sits in there but the problem is every one of the clips are broken off so we can't reuse it um, and there's going to be a lot of stuff in here I'm trying to keep the hours under 45 on this bad boy um, we're getting pretty dang close not charging him for the filming time of course but while we're draining and whatnot you know we can get some camera time in and this will help you guys in the future and it'll also help him down the road for if he needs parts or needs to figure out how something was done you always have these videos as a reference so upper coolant hose is done we need to put a little bracket on here to pull this back which is what they do for these swaps and then get the uh, rad support or the piece that goes across here which we also don't have that you need to work on the accelerator pedal at some point and the fuel shutoff. He said he wants a mechanical shutoff. Keep it simple. And that's just how we're going to do it. Mechanical shutoff. So we're going to get rid of the... Let me see if you guys will see it in there. 
Yeah, there you go. You can see it in there. So we'll get rid of that guy. So word advice for you guys, don't ever take the drain off for the transfer case until you get the plug for the fill out because there has been times where you will strip out a fill plug but the drain plug will come out and now you're screwed and can't change the fluid so don't uh don't be that guy that is some nasty transmission fluid that is nasty and brown well glad we're changing that we got fresh atf plus four for that and six quarts of pennzoil synchro mesh for that drive shaft is up and in the first half not the second half just the first half so we got that all bolted up now i'm gonna show you guys for the nv5600 i swear by this stuff i float my gears i tow heavy and i run this six quarts of pennzoil synchro mesh it has never let me down before and Pennzoil did not ever tell me to say this never sent me anything for free I pay for this stuff but if you guys want a good fluid for your NV5600 not 4500 make sure it's only for your 5600 this stuff is great so cannot use this in a 4500 unfortunately so my brother I forget he has a specific fluid he likes to run in his but I think mine lasted 547,000 miles. What ended up happening was sixth gear exploded, taking out the transmission. Synchros were perfect. Well, I was able to find one more of the cross member bolts. So we have one. Now we just need one more. This is not a cross member bolt. That is not thick enough, but I noticed there are guys, Greg Alberala was one of them that have this product, but they have a cross member delete that is actually it's just one steel bar that goes across with a couple of tabs and then it only uses the front two, or the back two holes i think so you can cut the front two off so you really only need two of the four but we're going to try to find the other two hopefully somewhere in the truck i haven't seen them yet but before i tell them to order them I'll tell them to order anything else until everything else is done so like we're finding still finding little nuts here and there and whatnot so this thing's definitely going to need a good clean out glad that i wouldn't mind being the guy to do it but it's not my job so let's get this fluid in and go from there all right long time coming but we got the interior let me get up in here got the interior all together See, get the seat fixed so the one thing i don't like is there's like no clutch pressure so i'm wondering if it needs new hydraulics but it always comes back so i don't know but you guys can see push clutch in one two four five six and then reverse so everything works we'll also have to get the four-wheel drive shifter on um turns out there was actually nine of those screws you know how there was six for this guy so the other three there's one that goes down in that hole one in that hole and then one up underneath of this guy here so there we go that is uh interior done check that off the list i don't need to get in this truck ever again now we got to get under it a bunch of times because we got the drive shaft i gotta find all of the bolts for that which i thought i did um yeah, there's a bunch of different bolts and stuff, so I'm going to start mixing and matching bolts together. These are for the interior, and then there was aha, one more. So I'm going to throw these in there. He's got a de big detail to go through and do with this thing, so kind of sucks. But All right, guys, you can see down in that shaft, which I'm going to clean out in a little bit. See how there's a notch right there? Same with that one right there. See how there's a spot where it's two teeth? You have to line those up. This drive shaft only goes in one way. So I'm gonna be spraying this thing out with some compressed air and PB blaster, kind of clean it up, and then possibly throw some grease in there. All right, drive shaft is officially in and on. She's tight. The only thing we have yet to do underneath of the back side of the truck is I do need to put this bolt back in. 
Uh, the cross member bolt, which I set somewhere so I didn't lose it. Probably hid it for myself. I think it, it might be under the truck. I don't know. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, so I got to put that back in, and then we got to fill the transfer case up with fluid because it's empty right now. So we got two quarts of ATF for that. And then I have a couple other things I need to do. So I am going to take my lunch now. I got tacos for lunch. Take my lunch, do some stuff on the computer, update this list for you guys. So after reading today's comments, some of the comments on today's video, this brought a really, really good question. I went over how much it's going to cost you to actually go through and do one of these. And I want to give you guys a reason. There's a few reasons when this is the perfect swap to do it. And it makes sense. Now, if you buy a truck that has no motor in it, this is a perfect thing. This is a perfect time to do a 12 valve swap. The reason I say that is because for you to physically go and find a common rail, you're gonna spend at least $4,500 for a complete common rail. Whereas you can find one of these for about two and it's not gonna cost you all that much, depending on how you wanna do it. If you find one without a motor, it's not all that much if you're gonna throw it in yourself. Um, you could be into it the same price, if not less. Or if you buy a truck that has a blown motor or a rod out the side or anything along those lines, that's going to be where your 12 valve swap makes sense. Uh, we're getting to the point where we're a little bit, like we're just about the 42 hour mark, like 41 hours and 45 minutes is what we're into this truck right now. I'm going to try to button this thing up as quick as possible. It's all little odds and ends at this point, like all with the engine. I just need to fill up the transfer case and then everything underneath is physically done. I can let this thing off the jack stands and then at that point, he's just gotta go get the batteries, we gotta get the key, um, plug a couple of things in, throttle cable, fuel shut off, just little odds and ends like that, that's pretty much it. So the nice thing is we'll be able to get this thing out of here. Just figured I'd let you guys know that is ultimately where it's gonna make sense. If you buy a truck with a blown motor, or no motor in it in general. Um, that's when this swap is gonna be worth it. Now, if you do want the simplicity and you wanna run paper logs, you can go and run a 12 valve. Now, anybody telling you that you cannot run a 12 valve in an older truck and you have to run logs, this is my fourth, fourth audit with a 12 valve swap truck fourth audit we're going through one right now you know what the dot officer asked for when he says about the logs you need a proof you need a piece of paper with the shop information on it and just pretty much proof that it was swapped now what this does is this allows you you keep it at the home office you do not ever need to show it to a dot officer if they ask you about your paper logs you don't have to show it to them because you're not required to carry it you are only required to have it at your home office, wherever the wherever you're working for, pretty much, whoever you're leased under, you're required to keep that piece of paper there. I have it, this is how many miles the engine had on it, and this is how many miles the truck had on it when we did the swap. So that's, I just sent that over to them, but that's what you're gonna have to pay attention to. All you need is that piece of paper, and then you're good. That's in Tennessee, that's in Minnesota, and Pennsylvania. Those are the three states that I have to deal, that I've had to deal with in the past and never had an issue with an older engine in a newer truck. There are some concerns about, you know, maybe this engine being gutless or, you know, it being an older engine, how does it perform? And I will tell you from my experience, my 12 valve pulls night and day better than my common rail ever did and does it by smoking a lot less. Um, I used to run a tow tune or a hot tune depending on what mood I was in and my 24 valve would smoke like a chimney. My 12 valve, I've been able to clear the smoke up, you know, it, it, a little puff here and there, but it's not smoky. I um, was able to do that, and honestly, it pulls so much better. I have a VGT turbo on it. Now, you're, you're not going to get a 12 valve to pull better than a 6.7. I can tell you that 100%. They, more displacement, VGT turbo, but you will get a 12 valve to pull better than a 24 valve 5.9. I can tell you that that is 100% doable. And honestly, if I had the option to go back to a common rail, I would honestly keep on with the 12 valve. Cheaper injectors, injectors are a big problem with common rails. And honestly, I think it pulls a lot better. Um, yeah, you know, you get the times where in the morning it kind of starts up like an asshole because that's just what 12 valves are. They're old grumpy, 
it's basically your old man waking him up in the middle of the night or early in the morning tell him to get ready for work you know that's how your 12 ob kind of acts in the morning but after that first initial startup every day and it starts up way better now with the grid heater or if you plug it in in the morning it doesn't care but if you're just firing it up in the morning that's the only really downside to it is some cold mornings it could be a pain in the ass to start now if you plug it in at night it's not going to notice it especially if it gets down to like 5 10 0 degrees your 12 ob will start up every single time if you plug it in it will start if you don't plug it in mine will at least but you're you're gonna fight it but i always plug my truck in anyway so no worries about that and if you have a grid heater you'll be able to start it in five to ten degree weather anyway so those are the pros those are the cons i'll probably come up with a lot more as you guys keep asking questions but appreciate you guys for being attentive to it and actually asking the questions gives me something to let you guys know hey let me address your concerns and go over it that way. Like I said, this swap is not for everybody. It's for me, but it's not for everybody. All right, so on your, I think it's 2003 to 2005 trucks, you will have this little box here and an actual throttle cable. It goes into here, okay? And then there's a sensor plug-in. Basically, you're gonna get rid of all of this. Uh, this is unnecessary to keep it's just something that's going to take up space if you wanted to get rid of the check engine light i mean you could always throw this in there but you're going to have a check engine light for other reasons anyway so you don't actually need this unless you want to do a throttle position sensor but again i'm not going to need this because this is going to vary from what you're going to do there so you're going to take out the oem throttle cable and you're going to run this to you can see right there the p-pump itself now mine, I got rid of this whole bracket because again, it's something that's unnecessary and just doesn't need to be there. Let me get you guys a little closer. So that can, ultimately you can get rid of that because you're not gonna have it for cruise control anyway. So I ended up making a bracket and looping this back around to pull on, you can see if I pull on it, you see that? So I have mine looped back around and just grabbing that. So none of this being necessary. That's just how I have mine. So this rod, I completely got rid of the rod and all of that. So it's up to him if he wants to do it. But this is, uh, like I was able to get rid of all the bracketry as well. It's just all unnecessary on this. But if you wanted to, you can run it to the factory location right there and just put it through and there you go. So we'll see what the best way of doing it is, but first thing, you just gotta pretty much remove it and it's not gonna be something you're gonna keep. And you guys will see down there, just, I have two zip ties on it now, but it's super tight. Um, you can rework this bracket or add some steel in to make this a solid fit, which obviously, like I said, this is just a temporary right now, just to get him going. And then if he wants to down the road after it makes him some money, then we can go through, look at that. We have a working throttle cable. That's what we want. And then we'll come back here, make sure that it actually kicks back the whole way. That way he doesn't get a, look at that, perfect. So make sure that it doesn't uh, hang up or anything. I'm noticing. So we do need for the power steering line, there's a T. There's a factory T. We don't exactly have that. So I'm gonna need to figure out where I can get one of them. So to use the factory intake elbow on the 12 valve, which you have to use, you can't use the common rail one or it'll hit back here. So the 12 valve one puts it back in the factory location. Now the thing is to get this on straight, you have to unscrew it first. Same with down here. So we got all of this, everything is tight. And then you can put this back on. You have to like finagle this back on and tighten it down. You can't have this tightened down and on and put this on straight. It just, it's not possible unless you have like three or four people. So the way that I'm doing it, get it tightened down and then we'll do that. And then this will kind of like sit at like a little bit of an angle, but boots are made to stretch. So we are good there. And I can tell this is a uh, 12 valve one, whereas like the common rail ones are like this design. So I just left the boot. It doesn't matter which one you use really, as long as you make sure that you unscrew this, get it tight, and then we'll put it back on. Use an electric ratchet. If you're doing these with your hand and just sitting here doing this, you are crazy. Get an electric ratchet, hold the button, it'll tighten it for you. Bada bing, bada boom, you're done, okay? Like this one here, a little rusty crusty. Use a little bit of lube and, a, uh, and an electric ratchet and just bzz, right on. 
All right, here's kind of what she looks like afterwards. That's, like I said, a 12 valve one, whereas the common rail ones, they kind of, they might flex a little bit nicer for you. Just like you guys can see like the difference here. So they both work the same. 12 valve one might, well, definitely a little longer now that it's been stretched out, but you guys get the point. So that side's done. Uh, probably gonna put this one at least in place a while. We still gotta work on the drain, the coolant lines but I need to go and get the proper bottom hose. And guys have been asking me about my front main for a while. I went and got a spare front main, so we're finally gonna do that. Well, I think we are officially at the point where we cannot physically do anymore. I need two more clamps for the other side. I'm gonna have to get, I got the wrong size coolant hose, so I'm gonna need to get three quarter, I believe it is, for the coolant lines and then a new lower rad hose, PCM, throttle for the fuel shutoff, and there's a couple of other things, uh, odds and ends that are on order. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna clean all of the mess up, get this thing off of blocks, move everything, assess what we have left, let him know. These ones were too big, this one we didn't need. So any of this stuff we can throw back in there. Uh, well, I guess I could put the factory intake back in. I guess I'll clean that big old hose clamp for that one. Yeah, I'm gonna get that cleaned out and this sprayed out with some air. So that'll sit on the turbo. So I can't put this stuff in yet, but there's that. And then we also need the bottom part. So we have a bottom, make sure it's not broken. Okay, so we have a bottom. There's that, and then uh, probably just clean this K&N air filter and just give him that. And there you go. Alright, this moment is long overdue. We finally get to close the tailgate. Wow, everything we needed, everything's pretty much the part list is zero now. So we're just putting our tools away now and calling it a day, I'm gonna get swept up, swept up and put the boards away. The only thing we have left is the stuff that's in there. So there's the intake, whatever leftover bolts we didn't use. Get these boards out of here. These things came in handy for when we dropped the transmission. Now I need to get it off of the boards in general. Yeah, this hose Three quarter inch ID inside diameter. So I think three quarter is too big. It might be five eighths, but it's definitely not half an inch. So we'll set that over there. Just want to get swept up, cleaned up, make it all look good, get everything out from underneath of it. Man, this guy's been looking for that. Whatever he's been looking for since he wrote that song, he still hasn't found what he's looking for. Well, now we sit and wait. Wait for the rest. So, um, two key things, because we could fire this motor right now. If we have, we just need to finish up the fuel return and inlet and the oil feed and drain. Once those two are done, the engine will physically fire up. It won't, you know, the alternator won't work and none of that will work, but that and, you know, batteries are probably pretty important, but there you go. Two weeks worth of work right there. Um, a lot of days I wasn't working on it because we were waiting on parts, so there was really nothing I could do, so there's no point in wasting time and trying to dick around with it. But now that everything, every major thing is done, and then the fuel shut off, you have to, to start it, you'd have to pull that fuel shut off up. Um, he wants a mechanical shut off. I'm gonna look in to see what it's gonna cost, if it would cost the same, if not less, to just wire that in. But if it's not the same, then we'll just, if, if it's going to cost a lot more and it's like the price is way different, then yeah, I'll, I'll just end up putting in the mechanical one like he asked for. The only downside about putting the mechanical shut off in these trucks is there's really no good spot to put it because like all of this is plastic. Like anything, you put it anywhere and it's going to pull out and you can see the dash. So like mine, I had to cut a section of this out right here and then... And what I did was I just put it back behind there and it works great, but it just, it's kind of ugly. And then this, like this comes down 
like this is just held in with clips and then two screws on the bottom but yeah this thing it's gonna need some extent extensive work and the this is somebody really jacked that up so this will have to get pulled out and whatnot and the four-wheel drive will not work unless you get out and get underneath the truck and like reach for it so he needs one of those but that's not what i was told to do so i'm gonna let him know list of things that we need and what needs done yet and we shall see but we're at the point where we're into it probably just about 43 44 hours and that lower drain or lower rad hose so i'll grab one of them as well look at that and we have a working hood latch let's see look at that look at that moment of truth oh look at that cool she is as done as she's ever gonna be till we get those parts seriously i hope you guys enjoyed this series uh there was a lot more hype in the beginning on this series which is kind of why like as I'm waiting on parts for this, I'm kind of filming other things because if I were to just do 10 videos of this in a row, people would get bored and just stop watching. That's just the nature of it. So I can only do so much, especially with the daily posting. Um, so that's kind of why I did it the way that I did it. But I am, I'll probably do one more video on this, which will be the fire up and then we're done. Unless other guys have some questions on anything you think I missed. But this is pretty much like two or three hours away from being a turnkey truck. So for the guys that enjoyed the series, hope you did. I'm gonna go check the PO box, see what we got. And we're pretty much done for the day. Maybe I'll wire in my pod lights that you guys. All right, so here's my thought process. We're gonna finish installing these aux beam lights that they sent me. So what I'm gonna end up doing is running it down. Um, unfortunately, going to run it in the front because somebody did make a good point about the amperage and whatnot. So we'll use the factory relay and then I'm going to reloom all of the wiring for it. But this is just going to be one, one relay here. So I did a fairly decent job of putting everything together. The only thing I didn't like was that the wires are separate. But these two will run parallel with each other all the way down into the engine bay. And you'll see right here it comes out. I was just going to run the two wires coming out of there. But someone made mention that uh, that's probably not a good idea just because of amperage and whatnot. So if we can run it and then run it to this switch right here, that's what we're going to do. So we'll punch it to that. So that's how we're going to do it. So I said screw it. And I just decided to do it the way that I was going to do it originally because I like to be that way. So what I'm going to do, come over here. Look at that. Now we have lights. Holy f God, they're bright. <laughs> Don't stare directly at them. But yes, I, I just wired it into the rear turn light or back light like I was going to because why not? So LEDs are not made to take that much energy. So I'm going to get all that cleaned up and now we have work lights and I don't got to run aftermarket wiring because that's what I wanted to avoid in the first place. If it ever becomes an issue, then I will take that light out and run my own stuff. But I'm going to go grab some RTV for the light so that we don't get water inside there and then we are good to go. Well, see you later truck and uh, I bid you farewell. I'm going to go grab him a list of what all needs done yet. Hopefully I got everything because I don't have the keys to get back in here. But super happy that the reverse lights are done. Yeah, I think that should be it. I don't think there's anything I left in here. My keys are out there and whatnot. So that can get to be a pain because once I lock this door, that's it. Ain't nobody getting in. So I'm gonna head home. I'm gonna relax for a little while. And then Monday I gotta go get the title for my trailer and then she is gone. Look at that booty. Can't wait to get nice tires on it. I gotta get all this. Can't wait to get that done. But in case you guys, let's see, pop this on. That's gonna be nice for blinding the shit out of people. It doesn't look that bright on camera, but I'm telling you, if you look into it, it is brutal.